Benny Banerjee. He's director of Stanford Change Lab. This is a platform that is generating new theories and processes to drive transformations where scale, complexity, and urgency are critical. Change Lab is a global network of institutions, designers, innovation experts, behavioral scientists, and technology strategies, all working towards new paradigms for scaled interventions towards sustainable and resilient solutions to global challenges such as climate change, energy, water, financial inclusion, rapid urbanization. So, Benny is teaching design and innovation strategy at the Stanford D School in the Stanford Design Program. Benny, please take the floor and thank you very much for coming. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me and for, for receiving me so warmly. Uh, I spent the day yesterday with, with, uh, the, uh, with Anton and some of the other uh, participants and, and this is my first visit to Vienna and it's already been a very memorable uh, visit. I hope to visit again. Um, what I would like to do today is share a few insights from the, the approaches that we are using to look at complex challenges, and we are bringing that thinking to the urban uh, challenge as well. Um, so first and foremost, uh, just to set the stage, um, the way we look at urban systems is that they are essentially systems of systems, and they're defined by a certain density of phenomena. So there's a high density of phenomena of different sorts, and it is the density uh, that gives you certain advantages and certain uh, uh, fragilities, and both of them are, are the, the two sides interplay in very interesting ways, and th that's how we approach the system. And ultimately, just like Anton mentioned, we look at the city as extremely con concentrated systems, but they're very dynamic and organic systems, which means that there's nothing that is really static. Everything is interrelated to each other and is in motion and has a temporal uh, dimension that one needs to understand in order to, to navigate in if you're trying to innovate change. Now, the one of the things to understand is that every system has a time constant which means that there is a clock tick by which things change. Um, so whether it is the ce one cell in your body or a stellar phenomenon such as, a, the, as a, you know, a supernova, everything has a clock tick. And within the city, you have phenomena that have different clock ticks. So on one hand, you might have uh, a city that is uh, the result of a very long genesis of, of political and, and historical events. But at the same time, something can happen, such as on the right, we have a woman st standing next to a, her house that has just been struck by earthquake. And that is something that happens in a very short period of time. And the responses to that also happens in a very short period of time. So there are different time scales happening at the same time, uh, concurrently. And a whole lot of the larger frameworks that we set up and the structural um, uh, the paradigms are ones that are very hard to change overnight. Uh, and so one of the issues that we have is that the, the nature of the changes that we need to make and the nature of the change we can make are at opposition. And, and given that the future looks very different from the basis by which our current systems have been created, there is a, is a real exigency to look at what the future systems might be in order to create the new paradigms. Uh, but it is to be emphasized that not all cities uh, take, take centuries to create. Uh, on the left is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, refugee camps in, in Jordan for the, for the it's, it houses 160,000 odd uh, refugees and on the right is, uh, is a festival called Burning Man that takes place in, 
in the city, in, in the desert in Nevada, where 65,000 people create an, an instant city in a week and then it becomes desert again. And what, what it means is that the city is not just infrastructure, it is the operating principles that makes the entire system work in a certain fashion. Um, now, the way we create our, our policies and the, the infrastructural affordances, the architecture, the spaces, etc., have a very deep uh, influence on the patterns of behavior. Um, and, and as we can see, uh, the way the policies and the, and the affordances have been created uh, influence behavior in vastly different ways in these two contexts where at the beginning of a day, the person who's just going to work is not making a very big decision as to whether I'm gonna take a car to work or whether I'm gonna ride to work. It is a, it's a part of a habit and either you jump on a bike or jump in a, into a car and that just seems to happen accepting that there are larger normative systems that are created, and that's what seems to be right. But these have tremendously large implications, because just look at the difference between the USA and Denmark. Uh, they, the per capita kilogram uh, of oil equivalent per capita is roughly half in Denmark that of the US. And the GDP per capita is roughly twice, right? This is remarkable. It's not 3% off, it's not 5% off, it's 50% off, right? That's remarkable. Uh, but meanwhile, one of the things that we are looking at is that the infrastructure and systems that are very slow to change are ones that are being inundated in, a, in the fastest way. So here are traffic jams in, in China and in Africa where the infrastructure simply can't cope with the rate at which they're being inundated, and that's one of the very dominant issues that we are seeing. But we also see very stark social divides that, that uh, are, are a result of the way we conceive of our cities and the way in which uh, wealth tends to support wealth and creates feedback loops that, that essentially reinforce the divides. But at an implicit level, we are also replacing one kind of complexity with another kind of complexity, and it's easy to essentially have a perceptual lens where if we are dealing with the issue of urbanization, we, are dealing, we think only of urban issues, but we are in a larger context where ultimately every city that we have has replaced something that was not a city and, and in, the, in, the, in the time span of, of the cr critical systems that keep our civilization alive, the changes happen in a microsecond. And so we need to keep this into the back of our mind that there is a certain function that we are dependent on, that we are stealing in replacing, replacing nature with cities, and, and, and our perceptual lenses need to account for that. But the other thing, of course, what Anton mentioned is that there are things that are difficult to, to essentially see, which are the implicit impact one is making. So Malcolm Wells called it death by abstraction. And that was a warning to, to designers saying that you are on a, on a tracing paper and you're, you have a pencil in your hand with each line somewhere else there are trees that are coming down and there's an open cast mining that you've just grown and it is very important to remember that as you're making the decisions now what we are seeing ultimately is a hugely layered system and my metaphor uh, and especially to those of people who are fellow architects is it's like tracing paper as you're designing a, a building uh, every aspect of the building system are dynamic. So the structural system, the way things are moving, the way the light plays out, the visual dimensions, the, the, the social commentary you're making, the, the situational commentary you're making, all of these are on the anvil all at the same time and they can pivot uh, in respect to each other, but in, in ultimately what you are producing is an integrated statement and in, integrated consequences. So as you look at a city, you're looking at, you're looking simultaneously at 
uh, human systems, social orders, governance systems, data systems, in, uh, technological infrastructure, hard infrastructure, the historical and cultural context, and in the context of the larger changes that are impending. And these are all layers, and they all interact with each other. So, so even while we are looking at phenomena on one layer, let's say you're just uh, concerned with the issue of how do you look at, at what data you can bring out and what nudges you can do, or how do you get more effective go governance, you're actually dealing with the whole nine yards with, of, the, of the different layers, and it's important to create a, a methodology and an innovation methodology that knows how to integrate across and innovate within that. So the other thing that is really important to understand that urbanization and urban systems are not an urban concept. It is a local maxima of a larger issue. So the reason why people move into the cities are not just a city issue. It's a regional issue, it's a national issue. It is the number of jobs or the food situation or the land holding situations elsewhere that lead people to move into the city and to populate the cities. And they look at those higher densities of phenomena as attractors to move in. So if you are to solve the issues or address the issues of the urban systems in the future, one way is to just look at it from the supply side of the equation saying let the changes happen, we'll deal with the changes. The other way is to also look at it from the demand side of the equation saying we will actually prevent some of those things from happening in the first place by addressing the larger issue. And that goes to dealing with national policies and, and also very large behavioral issues. So, so just to put it in perspective, the kind of growth projections we are seeing is currently we have cross the 50% margin in, in how many people live in urban, urban cities. And this is an earth-shattering fact, right? It didn't used to be this way. We crossed the 50% mark not too many years ago. It was only about three or four years ago that we crossed the 50% mark. And it's a, something to just stop and think about. Well, what is going to happen in the next uh, 30 years or so is that a very large number of uh, people, a large fraction of the people in a much larger population is going to live in, in urban areas, and we are going to add 2.5 billion people. Now, just to put that in perspective, it took us from the beginning of time to somewhere in the early 1800s to get to the first billion, right? So we're going to add twice of that, two and a half times that, to our cities. but. 90% of that growth is going to take place in Africa and India. And we are, we are going to have 41 plus megacities, and megacities are 10 million plus cities in, in that time frame, a large number of them in Africa and India, right? So the big question is how do we sustain this? How do we meet the, the demands of the basic resources? And how do we look at growth or, or the advancement in integrated ways towards our biggest challenges? And so if you look at, take a few steps back and look at what are the biggest challenges, first and foremost, we have resource limiters. We have the food, water, energy nexus, which is in, in tremendous threat. The housing, jobs, transportation, the waste issues, the, the pollution issues, the CO2 and the, and the climate issues, and the embodied energy. Embodied energy is, is not the same as life cycle energy, but it ta it's the energy it costs to make the thing in the first place. And, and the impact on national ecosystems. So this is one of the biggest limiters. Um, every city government will tell you that the cost per capita of governance uh, is, is decreasing or rather the cost is increasing while the budgets are shrinking with new targets. Um, social issues, crime, education, and quality of life are on the anvil and are under threat. And, and every kind of in, in infrastructure that you see are on the, on the threat of rapid inundation. And what that leads to is, is most often is deep inequity and social imbalance that leads to social you know, fallouts. And, and things such as very large conflicts that we are already seeing, but that's 
I, I agree that they're just precursors of a, of a you know, much larger degree that we are gonna see. But at an implicit level, if we are now, in a sense, thinking about how we should think about it, it takes our eye off the ball for the long-term future and forces us to concern ourselves with the short-term crises, and that continually creates a crisis in the long term, right? And all of this is taking place in a global kind of a, a backdrop which is, which is really like critical. We've arrived at a very, very critical juncture in the history of humankind. We are at a very critical juncture because never has civilization as we know, as we know it been threatened in such a systemic manner by growth limit, by limiters, right? So we need 40% more fresh water, 40 to 50% more food, you know, 45% more energy, a 50% uh, reduction in CO2, which should have happened a few hundred years ago, but we are quite late in, in making that happen and we are working too slow. We are in the midst of a mass extinction that there is no turning back from. So my, my colleagues in Stanford tell me it's worse than anyone imagines. It's a mass extinction, the kind that we haven't seen since the dinosaurs went extinct, right? And of course, we have a large number of people in poverty today, not counting the people who are gonna be born. And the confidence level in our current methodologies, if we were just to be objective with business as usual, is low to minimal, right? And so what this points out is that we need innovation of a, of a different order. We need in, to innovate on innovation itself, and we need very, very aggressive and scale forms of innovation. And I think the thing to recognize is that what, while a lot of these challenges are exponential, what we know how to do are relatively linear, and what we know how to do are things that plateau out. And so there is a theoretical gap where unless we find solutions that chase that curve, um, there is a limited amount that we can do. And the other aspect about systems theory is that when you have uh, balancing systems and what's called negative feedback loops, like let's say you have a chair that you're tilting and beyond a certain point, before a certain point you let go, it'll come back. But beyond a certain point it wants to tip over. And once you have feedback loops that support the change, so one example is the global ice cap melting. With the ice cap melting, there's less heat reflected, so more heat that's retained, that speeds up, the, speeds up the melting of the ice. So if you think about all the phenomena that we are talking about, most of them have positive feedback loops. When you have positive feedback loops, you run the risk of having the systems go into stochastic states where you cross tipping points and unfortunately, you know that you've crossed a tipping point in hindsight most times. Because what we find, the scientists, when they project, what they're finding is that every time, every year, they realize that their projections from last year were wrong and it wasn't, it was actually, things are worse than they were. So we, we really are in a critical state and, and I would argue that we need a new aesthetic. We need to look at what we are doing in a new way. And I would like to pose a question, and I call this a fish hook question, because a fish hook question, the idea is that it's a question that is designed to get lodged into a brain and not let go and spawn more questions, right? And the question is how do we collaborate with the future rather than antagonizing it? We have, as humans, we have a, we exhibit an extreme case of hyperbolic discounting where we place tremendous amount of value on the current rather than the future. And so we have, we are essentially in opposition with the future. And how do we do it such that we can actually move the needle, so to speak, right? How can we do it such that the effect is at a scale that matters? And so the work that we are doing kind of indicates that, that it is really worthwhile to look at change as a change in system behavior. And that comes from looking at behaviors, both of humans and of systems. Uh, you look at completely new frames for outcomes. Uh, you look at platforms rather than individual, uh, individual forays. 
and you look at new paradigms where you question the framework itself, and there are some chairs here. So, in order to get to those, you need a new kind of approach, and I'm going to repeat some of what happened, is that our disciplines are, cause us to have a certain kind of perceptual lens, and that means that we see what we are looking for. So, so an engineer, uh, if they were asked to describe this room, they would probably describe the structure of the room. A sociologist would look at the people dynamics in the room, and an architect would probably talk about the ceiling, right? And we all look for different things and see the different things, and it's like looking through slits at, at the world, but the world is complicated and complex, and, and the, the way the, the phenomena are have no respect for our disciplinary boundaries, none whatsoever. And so that integrated space is the real innovation canvas. That's where the action is. And, and so the difference between the traditional forms of collaboration is that you stick within your, your mental model of what needs to get done and what the action repertoire is. And, and what we are finding is that if you change that perspective and rather than the identity being your discipline, but you uh, start looking at the challenge as the, as the issue and you, are, you have an open boundary condition as to how to define the challenge, you have the opportunity to use different disciplines to create new epistemologies and ontologies. So new ways of constructing the truth, new ways of dealing with the truth, right? And essentially what you're getting is this, you having, you're, what you're getting is disciplinary parallax. So the people on, with one perceptual lens will argue about the diameter of the circle, and the other field discipline is gonna argue about what the rectangle is, but it takes the two to essentially see the larger reality, and that is what we need as a way in which to, to integrate our knowledge, our respective fields. So what we are looking for is treating the system as a very integrated uh, human technological infrastructural governance system. But what the means are very few, little and the targets are very high. So what that implies is that we need to do acupuncture. We need to find places where you can put the needle such, so as to have the largest change in system behavior. So you're putting system behavior in the center, you're surrounding it by different perspectives and creating the methodologies by which there's a new way of thinking, there's a new structure of thinking that places great, a great deal of emphasis on different ways of finding, of interrogating reality, of synthesizing, of framing, of creating very, very new propositions to bridges to very aggressively designed futures, not incremental moves, but radical moves. So, so in a sense, we, you know, I'm talking about a, a certain model. I've been describing a model that has you know, all sorts of names. Some people call it the deep, deep change model. But essentially, it is a, a, an embedding of, in, in the idea of what is scaled innovation and, and developing a methodology for it but really, really paying attention to the behavioral system. So we work very closely with the behavioral sciences, social cognitive theorists, behavioral economists, um, uh, cognitive psychologists, etc. because the largest number of moving parts in, in the world are the humans, uh, at least in, in terms of the, the consequences that we are talking about. And, and there is no real solution without uh, changing behavior in one way or the other and in a sense, if you can uh, describe, more than describe behavior, you can actually influence behavior, then behavior is no different from a technology. It is a technology. So, so the other thing is the way you think is, is take the ways designers and artists and, and, and people who do what's called abductive reasoning, which is different from, 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 uh, from inductive and deductive logic, and, and essentially think in imaginative ways about systems and, and, and use resi resilience theory and learn from ecology, but not lose sight of the pragmatic. Use technology and business models and, and policy systems and market strategies because these are super useful in beating the time constant. 
this is, these are some of the ways in which you can actually beat the time constant. And, and ultimately, what you're creating is a perspective for multi-outcome strategies. So in, we have some criteria that I would like to show, uh, share. One of them is that we look at multiple time frames at the same time. We look at short term and long term, and instead of creating an opposition, we say we have to find innovations that meet both criteria. We don't restrict ourselves to one objective. We say what are the, the, the system is playing out and it has multiple, multiple outcomes. We are going to change the behavior of the system so that multiple outcomes are, are influenced at the same time. We are looking, going to look at the very intimate scale in the experience of a person in a single day, in a single moment, in a single context, all the way out to, to larger things and have them relate to each other. Uh, and, and essentially try to cut through the, the uh, trap, which is people who understand context, uh, deep context really deeply, they tend not to understand the systemic issues. And people who are at the high level and, and know how the systemic issues, they're very removed from the context. And if you do things at the high level, they tend to crash and burn when you have a very large diversity in the context. So that becomes uh, a challenge about, about how do you look at that. And ultimately, you're looking at multiple stakeholders with multiple motivations. So essentially, you're looking at multi-motivational fields, and that's how we look at things as well. And you're, you're not saying that there's one pathway that will solve it all. You're looking for a system of pathways that have synergies between them, and they, they create feedback loops between them. And ultimately, of course, you're also saying that the, this requires different kinds of epistemologies, different kinds of thinking. And you're essentially allowing those to coexist with a, with a, with a sense of plurality, which is, is deplorably missing in our current thinking. So we are very partisan in our thinking. And it is because we are so divisive and we are so deterministic that so many of our problems go unsolved. And ultimately, I'll, I'll mention again that there is a way of thinking in platforms rather than individual uh, interventions that can can actually lead to scale, not that individual interventions don't have their place. So in, in closing, I would say that ultimately there is a set of, as if you're intervening in the system and if you're innovating in the system, you are not just doing innovation, you're in the business of doing extreme innovation. This is a different order of challenge. We do not have the right thinking in place. We need to we need to come up with a new class of thinking. We need to have a plurality of perspectives because a single perspective is likely to be a very narrow slit into a very complex reality. And we need to have very iterative, emerging, emergent ways of reconciling our own position. We need to look at highly integrated outcomes. And without really focusing on scale and impact, the chances that you're going to get there is, is compromised. It's a little bit like if you did not shoot for the moon, you would probably not even get to the top of a lamppost. So you need to have aspirations that are very, very large. So those are some mindset issues that we, we take to, to the drawing board when we design interventions. So with that, I'll close. Thank you.